Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, to, to James Crossley and also to Chris Keith for, for hosting and, and it's really been a wonderful conference and great to hear everybody's papers as well. So what I want to do today is explore the way that the public uses of the Bible contribute to acceptance of carcerality and the carceral state in the U.S. This is part of an intellectual and activist move toward prison abolition. So as James said, I am involved on the ground in political organizing. I've been doing police and, and prison organizing for since 2000. Um, and, and so I've been very much influenced by people like Angela Davis and the group Critical Resistance who are working toward prison abolition and trying to raise consciousness about prisons as a, as a form of slavery and as a form of racial oppression. Uh, the, the carceral technologies I'm concerned about, though, today go beyond prisons and include control tactics like walls, surveillance, policing, neighborhood watch, and even debt. With respect to imagining change, as we discussed yesterday, it has been become painfully clear in the U.S. that rational argument is not what can make a political difference. So perhaps affect theory can provide a framework for thinking about what drives commitment to the carceral state. Of course incarceration is economic, and of course it's racist, but it's also emotional, or more precisely affective, and aff meaning that it's not necessarily just a conscious emotional response. Carceral, carceral strategies work two ways. For some, they install fear, a sense of always already culpability, surveillance, and constraint. For others, they create safety. And for some people, maybe even most people, they do both. People can feel surveilled and vulnerable and still feel glad for uh, the police state or still call the police or still uh, hope that people get locked up. When the Bible is used in relation to this two-way strategy of control, carcerality is pitched as somehow comforting. Scripturalized surveillance and securitization create the effect of being known, a sense of interiority, a kind of stillness or cessation of motion. The movement inward is like a paternalistic homecoming, a guilty swaddling, or an atoned ensconcement. What I want to do today is show how the Bible contributes to this theopolitical inwardness that affirms carcerality. The movement toward interiority and inaction can be tracked through scriptural citations in the public sphere and in prisons. Three texts are prominent with respect to walls, prisons, surveillance, interiority, debt, and other forms of constraint. They are the book of Nehemiah about the rebuilding of the Jerusalem wall, Psalm 139, the Psalm of Surveillance, and Leviticus 16, which describes the ritual of the scapegoat. And these are three that I've pulled together. Um, there's obviously other texts that, that circulate, um, but I want to show how they're working in this sort of inward motion, um, a motion that slows and, and, and stagnates. Before I get into these texts, let me say a brief word about affect theory and about where we're at with US prisons. So affect theory is about as much about motion as it is about emotion. And this may seem like an odd fit in relation to prisons because prisons are very much spatially oriented but I do think that it's helpful for, for thinking through some of these issues. I'm not gonna take you into a long discussion of affect theory, but just enough for you to see where I'm, I'm coming from. So with respect to motion, Spinoza, who is the great granddaddy of affect theory, famously says that emotions are, quote, affections of the body by which the body's power of activity is increased or diminished. So things affect the body, and it, it might be things, people, contemplation of things, imagination of things, um, start movement in the body. Negative emotions, says Spinoza, are produced by things or contemplation and imagination of things that will decrease the body's power of activity and persistence. And positive emotions are produced by things that increase the body's power of activity. And readers of Spinoza have often pointed out that th there's a connection here to political agency and also to self-preservation. So Spinoza calls the will to persist conatus. People therefore pursue those interactions, emotions, and thoughts that, quote, increase or assist the body's power of activity. Following from Spinoza, scholars and philosophers have explored how motion 
in bodies creates political potentiality. People like Gilles Deleuze, Brian Massoumi, Aaron Manning, Catherine Stewart, Lauren Berlant, and many, many others. As you probably know, it's a bit of a wave in the humanities right now. And it's sort of taken, taken over from psychoanalytic modes of thinking. And at the end of the talk, I want to come back a little bit to that, those, um, to, to psychoanalysis, because I, I don't think we're done with psychoanalysis yet either. In contrast to thinking about how affect can increase power of activity, I'm considering how potentiality and movement are stifled affectively by carceral technologies. If there is motion in carcerality, it is a moving in, in, inward towards small spaces, an interiorizing and a slowing. Movement and power of activity is constricted through surveillance, <coughs> walls, prison, debt, and even death. Now, of course, I'm not flat-footedly suggesting that movement is good and stillness is bad. Uh, but force, constraint, and turning inward at the behest of a higher power is producing a political and national pathology. Carceral affect reduces power of activity, and it could be said to stall movement and ethics overall. So just to bring you up to speed where we're at with, in the US with prisons, the US is still the large, largest incarcerator of the, in the world with 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. You'll see this statistic floated a lot. It's now widely recognized that people in prison are disproportionately black and brown. So when you walk into a prison, you're just become immediately aware that there's a, uh, oh, thank you, that there's a, a warehousing of, of people, a warehousing of uh, black and brown people, of, of a certain economic status, and also a lot of mentally ill. So it's, it, it really is a, a, a social oppression and a, and a social warehousing. There's also pretty widespread recognition that, uh, that sentencing is disproportionate. So uh, white people are, are charged less and for more aggravated crimes than black and brown people are charged more for you know, nonviolent drug crimes. There is a large, prison, pres uh, large private prison industry as well. And, and this uh, contracts out facilities and beds. Um, it also contracts other services like transport, telephone services, parole services. Most prisons are federal and state run, but the, the private prison industry is a billion dollar industry and it, it really um, also contributes to the mode of thinking of prisons as a kind of money making enterprise. And just very quickly, this is uh, just the difference between federal and state prisons. So you can see that uh, federal prisons tend to have more drug charges, where state prisons tend to have uh, more violent crimes. So in the Obama era, there was a bipartisan push toward modest reforms on incarceration. And I will stress that these are moder moderate <coughs> reforms. In 2013, Attorney General Eric Holder issued guidance to allow leniency on mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenders. So mandatory minimums are a kind of fixed sentence that, that um, it's, it's written into law. So if you do something like say 10 grams of LSD on your first offense, you get 10 years. Um, and so you know, these don't at all take into account context or violence or, or perhaps you know, prosecutors often go for the highest sentence that they can get because they want their numbers to go up because they want crime to look like there's, there's a tough on crime policy. And so this, this guidance, and as you may know in the US, a lot of law is actually enacted through executive guidance. So there may be laws on the books, but they, the executive will say, well, you know, you don't really need to pay attention exactly to that. So Holder issued this guidance that, um, oops, I didn't, oh, I did not want to do any of that. There you, there you a little preview. There we go. Um, so when Holder issued this guidance, uh, it meant that prosecutors were not to use mandatory minimum sentences if it was a first-time offense, if it was nonviolent, and if it involved a small amount of drugs. So this resulted in a 14% drop in the federal prison population in the last five years. And there was legislation to come, uh, it was in, had made its way through committee and was onto the legislation, legislative calendar. 
and whether or not that's going to get taken up at this point, is, it, it's actually kind of doubtful. With the election of Trump and the appointment of Jeff Sessions as Attorney General, these reforms are all on rollback. Less than a month ago, on May 10th, uh, Sessions issued guidance that reversed what Holder had done, and he urged prosecutors to seek mandatory minimum sentences again. And while an Obama-era directive had said that the Federal Bureau of Prisons would no longer contract with private prisons, Sessions reversed that as well. And he also is notably on board with Trump's wall project and increased targeting and deportation of immigrants. And of course, the increased targeting of immigrants has a promise to be very good for private prisons because they typically are the ones that get the contracts for, for holding uh, for the detention of immigrants. So Sessions and the Department of Justice are pursuing two carceral strategies in Trump's America. One, the revigoration of the devastating drug war and to increased detention and deportation of immigrants. And both of these obviously extend far beyond prisons. So at this point, I'll move on to the biblical text. Sessions and Trump are both huge proponents of building the US-Mexico wall, which, by the way, already exists. Although designed to keep people out, the wall is carceral in the way that it symbolizes things like surveillance, border guards, immigration and customs enforcement, which is ICE, the increased ICE raids, detention, deportation, and vigilante groups. And this is really notable in the community where I live, which is a high immigrant community with a lot of undocumented workers. And people have to look out their window every day before they walk out of the house because they are, uh, they are worried that, that, that the ICE, um, who are often undercover, will be waiting for them. And that, that does happen. Um, and this is all since the election. Notably, in terms of space, the wall interiorizes. Wall rhetoric is nativist, as we'll see in a moment, and it's also comforting to its proponents in that it crea creates a sense of interiority and Americanness. In terms of motion and the imagination of motion, it reduces movement coming in from the outside, and it affectively produces the conflicting movements of threat and safety. And this, of course, largely depends on one's own positionality with respect to law enforcement. But even those of us who are, are you know, safe and we have white privilege, we still, you know, I'm an activist. I've been in jail. I, I still, I'm an immigrant. I, I feel it. You know, I, I don't feel it as strongly, certainly, as, as uh, many others. But, they're, they're, but I also benefit, being a professor and a homeowner, for some of, from some of these carceral strategies. So there's this two-way um, sort of push and pull between threat and safety, especially for people who are not, like th those who are under attack or, or under threat are really under threat and they don't feel that safety necessarily, but, but um, many people have that sort of dual response. Now the scriptural figure that is used to authorize the wall is Nehemiah, and I'm grateful to students who after the election brought these examples to me. In the church service uh, before Trump's inauguration, the very first conservative, uh, uh, sorry, not the very first, the very conservative Texan minister of First Baptist Dallas, Robert J Jeffries, gave a sermon that compared Trump to Nehemiah. And so we were talking about wall rhetoric. You know, it's in the Bible yesterday. Well, here, here it is. <laughs> he said um, got that he, he, he said, when I think of you, President-elect Trump, I am reminded of another great leader God chose thousands of years ago in Israel. Um, that man was ne Nehemiah, and he says uh, in the next bullet there, um, God instructed Nehemiah to build a wall around Jerusalem to protect its citizens from enemy attack. You see, God is not against building walls. So there's this conflation here between terrorism with the language of attack and immigration for economic reasons. We have a little, yes, clip of uh, him talking to Fox News. Can you make it big? Can you make it big? Operation Day during my sermon that God's the one who brought up the idea of walls. God called, told Nehemiah to build a wall around Jerusalem to protect the citizens. Walls are God's ideas to protect nations. And Lou, I think until the Mexican diocese is willing to call for the removal of the walls around the Vatican, the removal of metal detectors from St. Peter's Square, and the unlocking of the doors of the Vatican at night, until they're willing to do that, they need to keep the heck 
quiet about our country's wanting to protect itself against evildoers. So, Mexicans, all of them, are evildoers. They need to be quiet about the wall that Trump is trying to demand that they pay for. Um, so you can see, but they, but it's such self-righteous, you know, righteous anger, and it's also um, very anti-Catholic. So thinking about some of the the stuff that w uh, was talked about yesterday in terms of um, a kind of Protestantism and and the way that that fuels certain kinds of politics. Um, Jeff Sessions is al also referred to Nehemiah in a speech about immigration while he was still a, an Alabama senator. And here you can really see the nativist uh, rhetoric, and it's the, the top one. And I believe that uh, it's right and moral and just and biblical and that we have a lawful system of immigration for the nation state that we serve. And I know, and we've had economists come and testify before our committee, uh, that's Harvard Professor Borjas, the world's leading expert on it, that we bring in more labor than we can absorb, poor people have their wages go down. Poor people have their job prospects go down. Things aren't going good out there for the American people. And one of the reasons is that the extraordinary, unprecedented rate of immigration into our country, particularly in lower skills, and it's hammering good and decent people who need to be able to raise a family, take care of their children, uh, and they're not able to do so effectively. And I believe we can do better on that. I know that we can. You know, I recall Nehemiah returning uh, to um, Jerusalem, they asked for permission to go home, and the, the king let him go. And uh, he went home. It's a little bit of a humorous joke. I don't tend to um, say it. To do what? To build a wall. He went to build a wall in Jerusalem. And, and, and it wasn't to keep the people in, you know, give me a break. I'm not sure what the joke part was, but um, you see that the people loved it. So just a tiny bit of scratching reveals that in the US, descriptions of political leaders as Nehemiah has a long history. Their tradition of Nehemiah Americanus has been, uh, oops, there we go, has been uh, documented by historians like Sackman Berkovich, Ulrike Brunot, and James Patterson. Puritan Cotton Mather calls John Winthrop Nehemiah Americanus, Americanus in his biography of Winthrop. And Patterson documents the trend. During the American Revolution, many preachers used Nehemiah to think about defending the colony against Britain and also France and Catholicism. George Washington was called Nehemiah by preachers of his day. More recently, Jerry Falwell used the figure of Nehemiah defending against Sanballat and Tobias to encourage people to defend against the ACLU and Planned Parenthood. Uh, there's also a group, uh, Patterson points to this group, called the Wall Builders, headed up by this fellow, David Pat Barton, which seeks to bring the U.S. back to its founding biblical values, quote unquote, founding biblical values, and strengthen Christian civic engagement, and they take their name from Nehemiah. This group is also very conservative in other ways. It's very pro-life, homophobic, and Islamophobic, and they often reference the speeches of Jeffries. So there's this larger sort of movement a kind of biblical understanding that walls are good, that it's feeding into uh, certainly helping Trump out. In Trump's America, borders, walls, and the accompanying surveillance and policing is very alarming. And I want to highlight that wall rhetoric is not only about defense, it also interiorizes. The wall is pinch pitched as bringing comfort to regular Americans who are safe within its confines. Whiteness is implied as well. Latinx people are kept out by the wall, just as Arab and Muslim people are kept out by the travel ban. This carceral logic of interiority is intensified further in prison, which adds another level of interiority, constraining many of the, the resident black and brown people into a, a smaller space. Between the border and prisons, we can see a trend toward producing a white middle. Um, so, so the Make America Great Again is really, in some ways, a racial move, and carcerality is um, helping this to function. 
So one of the biblical texts that got me thinking about a biblically produced value on interiority in the U.S. is, the, is Psalm 139, which valorizes surveillance. Uh, it makes a couple of key appearances in the history of carcerality and U.S. slavery, and the text itself models the affect of threat, release, known interiority, and confined safety that I have been discussing. The psalm famously draws the links between surveillance and omniscience, and between omniscience and interiority. And I got interested in this psalm uh, because of its very frequent citation in the pro-life movement, especially verse 13, you knit me in the womb, which is taken as um, evidence of the personhood of the, the fetus. But the psalm is also very much used to instill um, surveillance and to imagine disciplinarity in the Foucauldian sense of the term. So just a quick example, kind of humorous. Um, Franklin Graham, who's Billy Graham's son, very conservative, more conservative than Billy even, um, recently chided Kate Middleton on the occasion of her lawsuit with the paparazzi for taking pictures of her naked. And he used, um, he used um, Psalm 139 to do so. He says, you know, she should know there's cameras everywhere, but, but she shouldn't be taking her top off at all because God's watching. Um, and, and then using Psalm 139, you know, God knows everything. Um, oh, sorry, I'll do it back. There we go. Um, on a more serious historic note, you may know that Psalm 139 is actually linked to the Panopticon. It appears as the epigraph to Bentham's outline of the plan of construction of a Panopticon penitentiary house, which was published in 1790. And the verses which you see there in italics um, are not actually in order. There's uh, verse 3, verse 11, and then verse 10. Uh, and the citation is not commented any further by Bentham, who was an avowed atheist, but it's obviously drawing this analogy between the omniscient God and the omniscient uh, central tower. Um, it also really emphasizes paternalistic rightness of the law, especially with the la using verse 10 out of order and putting it last, this idea of that, that your right hand will lead me. This is one of the few remaining, or it's just closed, um, panoptic prison in the U.S. It's in Stateville, it's Stateville Prison in Illinois. And uh, it was closed because it was just untenable. It was super loud, and the ventilation was terrible, and there were lots of um, cockroaches. So it's just, just been closed. Now, of course, the U.S. prison system it does not really begin to grow until after slavery, when freed slaves could be arrested for loitering or for not having contracts for employment. And then they could be put back to work in prisons and chain gangs. So you probably know this, but it's worth repeating. The 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution allows for slavery as punishment uh, for a crime. U.S. prisons are notorious for paying, you know, for making people work and paying them, you know, very low wages, like 25 cents an hour. You know, the really good jobs might get an hour, a dollar an hour. So it has really been critiqued for being a modern form of slavery. Prior to the emancipation of slaves, though, slaves were taught religion through catechism. And here's one that appeared in a Southern Episcopal paper in 1836. And tellingly, Psalm 139 appears in this catechism. Where is God? Everywhere. How much does God know? God knows you. Can you hide yourself from God? No. Um, so the, the, the use of this psalm in the context of slavery is very sinister, and, and there's a racialization here in surveillance. And though the subtext is obviously negative and obviously policing, the surface seems very nice, reassuring even. God sees you. Lucky you. And this is, again, a kind of paternalism that we see in Bentham's citation as well. The, psalm, it's, uh, the text of the psalm itself is a prototype for the conflicting positive and negative affects that I am suggesting is characteristic of U.S. carcerality. Biblical scholars like Yair Mazor and Carolyn Pressler have recognized the tension between threat and salvation in surveillance. As Pressler points out, surveillance resolves into trust largely because of the womb Im imagery. Affectively, the poem incites movement and then stillness, producing for the hearer a sense of threat and alleviation of threat. The poem imagines the physical pressure and fragmentation of surveillance, and then it relieves that discomfort by imagining interiority, security, and visibility. I'm not going to take you in detail through the poem, but just give you a couple of examples here. 
The first part of the poem shifts from fragmentation to possibility and back again. It's as if the body is first compressed, then <clears throat> spun centrifugally apart, uh, and then finally being caught and being brought back under God's control. And the poem uses many double entendres and, uh, that create this ambivalence, and these are lost in, in translation, so to think a little bit with Christina. So the, in verse three, you search out my path and my lying down. Zara, the, the verb that is used, is really more, almost always means to scatter. So it's a much, uh, <laughs> it's more negative than you might think. Um, or the first verse in, in, in uh, first verb in verse five, usually translated, you hem me in, really is usually uh, translated as, uh, as to lay siege. So it's as if God is laying siege on the poet. But the second part of the lines uh, render these ambivalent, ambivalent terms more benign and positive. So in um, verse three, the tsara, the scattering, is made softer with this with sakan, you are acquainted with all my ways. And after, if, if in verse five, you get this um, siege and the heavy hand of God, verse six lifts that weight, such knowledge is, is, is too wonderful for me, so high. So there's a stretching, um, a sense of bodily aspiration. The dynamic shifts again in verses seven to nine in a variation that spins the body in the opposite direction from potentially positive bodily motion to dispersion and destabilization. So you get this, oh, <laughs> Sorry. apparently I have a, I have a heavy hand. <laughs> <laughs> So you get this um, potentially neutral uh, question, where can I go from your spirit? And then it quickly moves into the threat of flight and pursuit with Barach. And in verse eight, if I ascend to the heavens, uh, it's quickly followed by, if I'm spread out in Sheol, you are there. So followed by dis disintegration. So the movement and fragmentation in the first part of the psalm is then ameliorated in the second part of the, the, the poem. And this second part amplifies the sense of God's vision and at the same time it creates a sense of security through the language of creation and interiority. The poetic shifts might, to a Spinozan reader, uh, suggest a diminution of bodily activity and therefore negative emotion and yet the language of creation, gestation, fixity, renders a kind of stillness and security. We get the womb, creation, containment, permanent, fixity, and chosenness, all of which are validated by God's vision. Surveillance and interiority are, are something of a boon, and movement in the poem is kind of threatening, maybe a little bit exciting, but it's a threat that's resolved through God's vision and interiority. And I'm not gonna spend a a lot of time on this last part of the poem, but its, it's, it's aggression is very interesting to me. It's the security is, that's produced through the alleviation of threat in the first two parts of the poem results in, in uh, hatred towards others. Trump might call them evil losers, as he's done recently. Um, so this movement in the poem, I suggest, is not unlike that of the border wall. There's a movement from the outside to the inside. It's a shift from expansive movement into contained space and a very small space at that. And where I'm moving here is that the, the US seems to have a love affair with interiority. And you see this um, a little bit with what you were talking about, Joe, about, about the sort of stripping down in simplicity. Although I do think walls are very important here. You see it in carcerality. And I don't really have time to develop this fully right now, but you can see it in the extensive political discourse built on the fetus. The fetus re represents the true white inside, which is also innocent, a time before sinfulness. So this brings me to my last scenario, which has to do with biblical teaching inside prisons on atonement. Debt and indebtedness enter the equation here, which also has to do with movement. Debt could be said to slow people down. As people are literally moved to situations of containment, they are also saddled with literal and figural debt that effectively contributes to their immobility. Now the Bible is very frequently taught in prisons, and I will reference my own observations. The women that we, um, that we are involved with in the writing workshop, we sort of, uh, 
cooperate. We've done it for many years, and we bring students in, and they co-learn with the women inside. And many of them, once they hear that I'm a biblical professor, want to tell me they're taking you know, div divinity school. They really believe in the Bible. And I just have to sort of skirt those conversations because I don't want to take the Bible away from them. It's a survival tactic. And yet, um, I, I, I see it as a kind of, it, it seems very damaging. People, the people will often say, you know, it's good that I came to prison. And now I'm getting my life on track. Jesus is helping me to get my life on track. And so it, uh, the, the teaching of the Bible in prison really ends up uh, validating the fact that people are inside. Um, and, th and the reason the, the Bible is taught uh, so much in prisons is because prison ministries have been actively promoted and they have proliferated since 2001 under the direction first of Jeb Bush in Florida when he was governor and then George W. Bush in Washington. So these programs, they take a variety of forms. They could be weekly Bible studies, um, and then there are also separate housing units called God Pods that have better food and, and more freedom. And there are even full faith-based prisons. So Florida has three full faith-based prisons and about 12 faith-based dorms. One of the best known and largest faith-based prisons is prison, uh, the ministries, is um, Prison Fellowship, which was begun by Chuck Colson of the Watergate scandal. So after he went to prison for Watergate, he, he realized that prisons aren't good. And he had a conversion experience, and he began this big ministry. So here is the description of a prison fellowship Easter service at the notorious Rikers Island jail complex for New York City. The account tells of the positive response of the men inside to Christ's atoning sacrifice. We opened our Bibles to Leviticus 16 and visited the celebration of atonement, where a priest laid his hands on the goat's head and placed the sins of the people there. We envisioned the walk Jesus made, carrying the sins of every human to the cross and away from us, a holy scapegoat given freely for each and every one of us. I asked the men if they wished to place their sins upon Jesus, have him pay for them, and experience real freedom. What a wondrous miracle it was to watch 83 inmates stand up and say, yes, I need forgiveness, I will follow Jesus. Now, if we spend some time with this particular teaching, we will see that it rhetorically produces both spatial and somatic affect. It fo fosters acceptance of incarceration and emphasizes a notion of debt. Let's reconstruct the event. Imagine, there you are, incarcerated on Rikers Island. Uh, because it's a jail, you're most likely waiting for trial. The average stay is about 57 days, but some people get lost in limbo and are there up to three years. So there you are waiting for a longer sentence, and here come these nice people with their Bibles. Let's turn to Leviticus 16. So Aaron is to take a bull for him, for, to, to offer for himself, and then he's to take two goats, uh, and, and then he casts lo lots for the goats. One is to be sacrificed, and the other is to be sent out into the wilderness. Aaron is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. So this is the language of being expelled, of being sent away and abandoned to die. The options are stark. Wouldn't anyone take the option of being given by prison fellowship of staying put and accepting Christ? Notice the movement here. The Jesus goat goes out and the incarcerated stay in. The effect is to garner consent for being inside. There is an imaginative movement from threat to safety, from potential exteriority to grateful interiority. Debt to the Jesus goat ends up modeling a kind of immobility. It's ironic since identification with the scapegoat would be about movement, even escape, but instead Jesus goes out in sacrifice. And I'm not going to really get into this, but there's also a whole, um, uh, you know, the goat is Azazel, and so there's a whole, um, there's even some conspiracy theories about, about um, the demonic scapegoat. What's really important, though, here is the language of atonement. And this isn't actually a goat, but um, it's, it's not technically a goat, but you get the point. Um, the religious language of sin and salvation in these programs is based on an economic model of debt and payment. The men are asked if they want Jesus to pay for their sins. In this worldview, the incarcerated person is a criminal, a sinner, and can only be reformed by salvation through atonement. 
Prison Fellowship is big on the doctrine of atonement, as are many faith-based ministries, and you can look through their mission statements online and see that they all reference the atoning work of Christ. Greg Carey has talked about how atonement theology feeds an ideology or a belief in retributive punishment, and Hollis Phelps has written about how atonement theology, quote, adds theological and moral weight to neoliberalism's own creation of indebted subjects. There's a sense in prison ministry that those inside are extra indebted because extra sinful. Prison fellowship claims, for instance, that, quote, crime is fundamentally a moral problem and a result of rebellion against God. It is secondarily a socioeconomic problem. Now, of course, as Nietzsche noted, punishment itself, such as being in prison, increases a sense of guilt and emphasizes moral indebtedness. And so you already have this sort of sense of guilt and indebtedness and then uh, atonement theology adds another layer. And so spiritual debt is added to debt to society. Um, Miranda Joseph in her book, Debt to Society, argues that accounting metaphors of indebtedness have become part of the way that punishment is understood, and this is um, basically since Cesar Beccaria's influential treatise on crimes and punishment in 1764. He conceived of the social contract as a kind of debt-producing obligation. Law-abiding behavior was a credit paid, and crimes was a, crime was a lapse into social debt. So you get spiritual debt, debt to society, and then added to this, you get literal debt. So the prison industrial complex produces literal debt from rest institution fines, which can be up to $10,000 for a felony, um, jail fees, so there are a lot of jails that make you pay for your time in jail while you're waiting trial. Uh, there are parole fees, so when you get out, you have more fees that you have to, to, to pay. So people go into prison with debts, and then those debts are garnered from their very meager wages, uh, which they also have to use to buy anything, you know, cigarettes or food that's not disgusting or, you know, anything that they, they, that they want to buy, phone, phone services, etc. And then they come out of prison with debt. So you can see how this might create a kind of stalling cycle, whereby coming out of prison, being unemployed, stigma, debt, this, this could all cause people to turn to alternative co economies that then land them up in prison again. And then you have things like payday loans, which have incredible rates of interest, that, that people take out and then they can't pay back so they have to take another loan. So it's, it's just really a, a, a distressing situation. Debt becomes strongly associated with immobility, both literally and figuratively. It affectively decreases power of activity. Now of course, more generally speaking, debt can be understood as a kind of, or, or meant to produce mobility, right? Um, it, people can buy cars, they can buy houses. I mean, it, it does produce a kind of upward mobility, and there are, there's a recent um, issue of cultural, uh, cultural, cultural studies, the journal, that, that looks at debt as a kind of mobility producing. But Maurizio Lazzarato has argued it's also very strongly a form of social control, making people infinitely more governable. So debt might provide social mobility for some people, but it's really immobilizing for others. And obviously, this relates to class. I want to think about mobility uh, and debt in relation to affect theory as well. So Greg Siegworth and Matt Thiessen talk about credit and debt as, as secretions. They describe the pursuit of financial liquidity in futures markets as a kind of secreting plasma. And they're drawing on uh, Deleuze and Guattari's elaboration of secret, secrecy and secretion, which is the content form and expression of secrets. Production of liquidity is a kind of open secret, hidden from the public, but actively producing credit from debt. Transactions of ever-increasing credit and debt operate out of sight in secret. As liquidity pools, debt secretes. If liquidity races toward the future, debt slows people down, sucking them into pooling secretions. Hence the image. Uh, we can think of prisons, too, as a kind of open secret. Everybody knows that they're there. They're producing interest for some people. Um, and there's an affect to interest as well, which we can talk about in questions if we want. Um, and then it's creating the cesspool of debt for others. So an analysis of debt to immobility could also usefully draw on Mel Chen's discussion of racialized hierarchies of animacy. 
As Chen points out, in the US, linguistics, cultural structures, and ontological imaginations grant animacy, that is agency, purpose, activity, to some social actors more than others, with predictably white, free adult men on the top of the hierarchy. Chen shows how racialized or colonialized people, immigrants, and also differently abled people <laughs> are objectified and dehumanized through rhetorical association with things considered less animate like, than humans, things like animals or vegetables or non-organic matter. So debt, which we are seeing is racialized or can be racialized, um, is a, is a block, can be a block to mobility and even ability to move and to grow. Debt slows people down, creates immobility, blockages, pockets of impossibility. Debt is doubly immobilizing for the incarcerated, whether this is spiritual or psychological or literal debt. Prisons interiorize and slow the incarcerated on multiple levels. Andrew Diltz points out in his study of punishment in the US, um, that the, the, in, and this is particularly within US liberalism, the good U.S. citizen is typically figured in legal and political discourse as white, male, able, and innocent. So conversely, the incarcerated are disenfranchised, non-citizens often, and in a way they are disabled. So to draw this all together, I've been tracing the kind of, do I have a slide? No. Um, I've been tracing the kind of interiority and stultification that is produced through borders, through surveillance, and in spiritual teaching in prisons. In each case, interiority is seen as a positive, creating safety from threat. Scripture trains people in this affect, to see otherness as movement and as potential threat, and to see it ameliorated through interiority and inaction. The effects of this turning inward are quite negative, there, we see them in exclusion, oppression, or even as we saw simply nativist mediocrity. This inward turning self is, uh, is self-referential and thought of as chosenness. It tries to shore up national ident identity and preserve Americanness as whiteness. Ultimately though, I think it produces a kind of democratic autoimmunity, the, the kind that Derrida speaks about. As a pathology, this continual turning inward and slowing down could be called melancholic. And here's the turn to the, to the psychoanalytic. So remember that for Freud, the melancholic person pathologically incorporates the lost object into the ego, um, and, and it's the never loved, never lost, and, and it becomes part of the ego rather than uh, in, in mourning where the, the lost object is let go. In prisons, the never loved and never lost criminalized population is spatially segregated and interiorized in the identity and functioning of the nation. My colleague in Africana studies, Valerie Thomas, often points out just how much cultural ability and talent is locked away. And we do see this in the writing workshop. These women are amazing writers. They're published, they're, they're spoken word artists, they're um, artist artists, they're, they're, they're amazing. And all of this is cultural talent that is just out of sight, out of mind, caged. So this loss potentially reduces and stalls the nation overall. And I, uh, this is a bold claim, but it could be one reason that the US is failing as it is. But as we've learned through queer theory, melancholia is not only a pathology, it can also be a site of disruption and an ethical starting point. And um, Munoz has talked about this, um, there's some really good work on ecology and, and uh, queer theory that's, that's worked on this as well. Um, in other words, the lost object can start moving again, perhaps assisting power of activity and thought in a new kind of polity. Public recognition of this loss and its potential could start movement toward new modes of social organization. We might also rethink the figure of the scapegoat as artist Micah Bazant has done in his Miklat Miklat installation in New York. The sins borne by the scapegoat turn into the city of refuge. Now in the colloquial sense, people in prisons are scapegoated for economic failures. They bear the debt of those making interest on their incarceration. But perhaps the scapegoat could become a figure of freedom. Interiority within the US may be stalled, carceral, and pathological. But in contrast, being sent out from the city might be, as Mary Douglas considers, something good for goats, sent to graze in the border between cultivated land and sun-scorched earth. 
The goat is not hindered by walls, political uh, police surveillance, or self-scrutiny. Rather, we could see the goat not as sacrificial, but instead we could see it as being set free. Thank you.